Ready? Get set. Go! BMW is celebrating the 40th anniversary of its popular 3 Series. Since their debut in 1975, these cars have developed a reputation as solid compacts that are fun to drive. There have been six generations of 3 Series cars, and each has been built on the success of its predecessor. The third generation featured a completely new design, a distinctive wedge shape. The wheelbase was extended by 13 centimeters, making for a more spacious passenger compartment, and BMW kept designing new 3 Series body styles, including sedans, convertibles, coupes, touring cars, and the motorsport version. The fifth generation came out with an impressive array of innovations in the engine and chassis, and it was more comfortable. The latest 3 Series generation will pick up right where the fifth generation left off. Automotive journalist Hans Joachim Reig says BMW has sharpened its focus in all the right places for the sixth generation. The engines are more efficient, the suspensions improved, and all-round full LED lights have been added. The sixth generation BMWs may not inspire oohs and ahs, but then they weren't intended to. At night, the optional full LED headlights really stand out, but optically, the design is more reserved. And that's not a bad thing. The 3 Series have always been icons of style. We took a top-of-the-line 340i out for a test drive. It's powered by a 240 kilowatt twin power turbo inline six-cylinder engine. BMW didn't change much in the design of the passenger compartment. The chrome accents are still there, lending, as ever, a quiet grace to the interior. Joachim Reg points out that the advantages of the 340i's high-performance 326-horsepower engine and adds that this engine runs a lot more efficiently than previous designs. Fuel consumption can easily hit 9 liters per 100 kilometers. Wer will, kann dieses Auto locker unter 9 liter bewegen. It's not easy to combine that kind of horsepower with fuel efficiency, but BMW was up to the task. BMW itself rates fuel consumption at 6.8 liters. The new 340i has also cut CO2 emissions by 11% over the previous generation. Hans Joachim Reig says he really likes the improvements BMW has made to the suspension. That makes for an especially smooth and comfortable ride. But it also has good stability and traction going into curves. About 25% of all new BMWs sold are 3 Series models. There's a wide variety of engine options to choose from. Four gasoline and seven diesel-powered models, ranging from 85 to 240 kilowatts. These cars range from 30,200 to just under 57,000 euros in Germany. Hans Joachim really likes the way the BMW has re-engineered the 3 Series. He's particularly impressed with a wide range of engine options, from the 3-cylinder 5.1-liter to the 240-kilowatt 340i. Ines presents Volvo's V40 hatchback. She says it's like a premium version of the VW Golf. Ines is going to find out whether the V40's design and top-of-the-line features will set it apart from its compact competitors. 
The v 40 sleek design is distinctive. That includes the V-shaped hood, which gives the car a look that's at once bold and elegant. The rear of the car features a streamlined combination of glass and metal that surrounds the six-sided tailgate. Other attractive features include the angular taillights that rise to the C-pillar. Enos points out that the V40 is powered by the all-new Drive-E powertrain, which includes the two-liter engine. There's a whole range of units to choose from, diesel and gasoline, and various performance options. There are three diesel and three gasoline engine options. We're testing the middle diesel model, which comes with a manual six-speed gearbox. All models, though, are also available with automatic transmission. The short throw shifter has a sports car feel to it, and the suspension is comfortably tuned. The V40 goes from zero to 100 kilometers per hour in 8.4 seconds and has a top speed of 210. The German price for the car we're testing today is just under 30,000 euros. Add on a few accessories, and it'll cost a few grand more. Enos highlights Volvo's use of fuel-efficient engines. The D3 model that we're testing generates 110 kilowatts and uses just 3.8 liters of fuel to cover 100 kilometers. Those numbers show up on the dynamometer. But with a torque rating of 320 newton meters, it's so much fun to accelerate quickly that people will have a tough time hitting 3.8 liters. The V40's interior looks very Scandinavian. It's functional, but with the occasional touch of extravagance, like the floating center console. Among the optional extras is a leather driver's seat, complete with a seat adjustment memory function. Ina says the V40 has three main equipment options. Today we're using the second one. It's got a great mix of colors, materials, and surfaces. She also likes the simple design of the buttons. It's all very well designed and easy to operate. The V40's back bench has plenty of room. There are some smart looking cup holders and you can take out the central armrest so you'll have even more space to stretch out. The rear seats are split and can be folded down to create plenty of cargo space. And when you fold them back up, you'll find hooks that you can hang your shopping bags on. Enos really likes the design of the Volvo V40 and really enjoyed driving it. In Germany, the basic model costs under 24,000 euros. What's more, you can add a large number of extra safety features. It comes standard equipped with the city safety assistant and an external airbag that stretches across the front of the car to protect pedestrians. Volvo has a solid reputation for building safe cars, and the V40 continues that tradition. We think the improvements that Volvo has made to this model will help put it out front of the competition and sets a new standard for pedestrian protection. The new MX-5 will be hitting the road in September. Mazda has managed to cut its weight by 100 kilos. The legendary Roadster is powered by a choice of engines with 96 or 118 kilowatts of output. 
prices in Germany start at 23,000 euros, going up to 30 grand for that top of the line edition. The Audi S8 is now also available as a performance edition called Plus. 445 kilowatts catapult the car from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 3.8 seconds. The dynamic package standard fitted in Germany pushes the top speed to 305 kilometers per hour. It'll go on sale in Germany for 145,000 euros. The Fiat Cinquecento was an automotive legend when it was brought back in 2007, following the revival of other retro legends like the Beetle and the Mini, all now fixtures on Europe's roads. The Fiat Car tester Andrei Zimmermann describes the new Fiat 500 as the quintessential success story, with some one and a half million sales. It's the second biggest seller among subcompact city cars in Germany, and the number one seller in all of Europe. Now Fiat has thoroughly upgraded it. About half of the Fiat 500's buyers opt for the basic engine, combined with a top-of-the-line equipment option, known as the lounge. At 115 grams of CO2 per kilometer, the 1.2-liter engine still emits more CO2 than the stronger twin-air engines. In Germany, the starting price for our test car is 14,650 euros, with no extras. Andre likes the Fiat 500 compared to other subcompacts because of the well-balanced steering. He says it's noticeably tighter, but the city button loosens it up a bit without it becoming ridiculously squishy. Easy maneuverability is one of the main selling points of subcompacts, as they're generally used for driving around town. But what's really and truly new about the new Fiat 500? Eva Wagner of Fiat says that they had to be very, very careful with such an icon. The risk of somehow ruining the design was enormous, so they concentrated on stressing precisely those elements that make the 500 one of a kind. One of those features is nicknamed the mustache, the chrome that runs between the Fiat logo and the headlights. The LED daytime running lights are designed in the style of the 500's logo. A choice of no less than 10 different light alloy rims helps to personalize the new 500. One of the most conspicuous changes is the tail light inlay in the body's paint. The sat-nav's display is a bit on the small side, but it has options. For example, enabling the driver to stream music from the internet in conjunction with a smartphone. And state-of-the-art instruments are presented in the classic look. The full-size lockable glove compartment is also new. Andre likes the Fiat 500's retro chic interior, but he doesn't like the seat height. He's quite tall, so even at the lowest setting, he feels a little squeezed in. Shorter people could go for it, though. Andre doesn't see many real changes to the new Fiat 500, but the touch-ups to the exterior do make it more stylish. The unique selling point among subcompacts is yet to come, a diesel engine. Racing drivers often call the Spa Francorchamps the roller coaster in the Ardennes. Before hosting the Belgian Grand Prix later this month, the track tested drivers' endurance at the annual total 24 hours of spa race. It was a special occasion for BMW, the final competition for the Z4 GT3, plus the 50-year anniversary Pascal X and Gerard Langlois victory. BMW's first win here. BMW started with quite new family of cars, and we had very much pleasure in racing the 700 BMW. That was the reason, the first love, the first reason to love BMW. BMW has racked up a total of 21 victories on this highly demanding track. This time, though, weather conditions were anything but helpful.
BMW driver Lucas Lohr says Spa is one of the last old school tracks. It separates the men from the boys. The Royal Motorsport team faced a rather particular challenge. Joining DTM winner Bruno Spengler and former Formula One driver Timo Glock was Alessandro Sanari, who lost both legs in a crash in 2001. Of course, it's uh, quite difficult to put all the three together, especially because uh, for, the, for Alex. But I think uh, together with BMW, we managed very well. And uh, till now, I think everybody has done a good job. There's nothing more we could do to show up better prepared. And uh, I'm very, very pleased and excited and proud to be part of, uh, of this team. We have fantastic engineers and mechanics. It's a pleasure to be together with Alex and Timo. Alex has taught me a lot about racing, which is why it's so much fun here. We want to find our pace right at the start, then we'll see how we fare at night and through the whole 24 hours. The driver changes added extra excitement, not least when Alessandro Sanari made way for Bruno Spengler. During the pit stops, the crew had to adapt the car to the different requirements of drivers with and without legs. BMW created special components for accelerating, braking, and shifting with modifications to the pedals and clutch. Plus, each of the three drivers had steering wheels adapted to their needs. The engineers also optimized the seat position and installed air conditioning. Uh, conditions are very tricky, very difficult because uh, you got a dry line, but uh, if you go out uh, from that ideal line, then uh, it's literally night and day. Sometimes Alessandro drives a little on the wild side. Yeah, a little too, too fast, but uh, what can I do? It's behind me now. I'm young, I need to learn. The three-man team at the wheel were doing pretty well as they reeled off one seven-kilometer lap after the next. 24 hours is the toughest discipline in motorsports for man, machine, and the whole crew. If you look at the team, you can see the total 24 hours of action can take on the cars, too. But then, in the final hour, Sonardi and his co-drivers had to drop out due to a technical defect. Among the Mark VDS racing team, the mood was more upbeat. Marcus Paltala, Lucas Lohr, and Nick Katzburg were pushing at the head of the pack in their BMW Z4 GT3. And they went on to take the checkered flag, finishing ahead of the two Audi teams, WRT and Phoenix Racing. It was the Z4 GT3's first win at the Endurance Classic. And it's swan song. Next season, BMW will be competing with the M6 GT3. Armies of tradesmen have spent a good part of their lives in the driver's seat of the very first generation of the VW bus, called simply the T1. Driver Christoph Bauer is taking one of the more than 1.8 million T1s built out for a spin. The VW bus was the right vehicle at the right time. Christoph recalls its history starting in 1947 as West Germany was still rebuilding from the Second World War. Back then, tradespeople urgently needed a practical utility van to carry their tools and materials from A to B. Despite the massive damage at the VW plant in Wolfsburg, a solution was eventually found. At the time, the VW workers were carrying parts and materials with a transporter they'd built themselves by putting a simple flatbed on a Beetle chassis and engine. The parts carrier inspired visiting Dutch VW importer Ben Pon to sketch what would become the VW bus. The engineering was based entirely on the still new Beetle, the only VW in production at the time. 
Kristoff continues, in the autumn of 1948, VW Chief Heinrich Nordhof approved the construction of a utility van designed to carry a 750 kilogram payload based on the dependable VW Beetle. But it was not that easy, nor cheap. As it happened, the Beetle chassis tended to break up under a full load on the poor quality roads of the time. The Beetle's platform chassis wasn't strong enough to handle the one and a half tons of a fully loaded transporter. So VW's engineers created a new ladder chassis with a single unit body. But the axles, engine and many other parts were still taken from the Beetle. It was 1950 and all they needed was the right name. Christoph explains that in Germany, the VW bus is known as the bully, a word combination from bus and the German word Lieferwagen or delivery van. Unfortunately, the name was already trademarked and other suggestions such as Felix, Jewel, Mulix and Triumphator were also shot down by the patent office. So what? The VW bus was given the simple designation Type 2, but its German fans didn't care. They still know it as the bully today. The VW bus was a hit with the car buying public in Germany and the world over. In 1954, the 100,000th unit came off the production line. Extra additions like the Samba bus and the practical flatbed pickup soon appeared. The highly versatile VW bus enjoyed huge popularity. For Christoph, this is one of the friendliest and most likable faces in automotive history. These funny big eyes attract lots of nostalgic looks on the road, but the bus came close to looking quite different. Production would have been a great deal cheaper for a body with square contours, but tests in the wind tunnel showed that round edges made for much less wind resistance. So the VW bus was, in fact, one of the pioneers of aerodynamics. The split front windshield, the V-shaped front panel, and a gargantuan VW emblem gave the first generation of the bus its now iconic face. A higher ground clearance and a practical flatbed with an optional canvas cover helped make the T1 pickup the ideal construction site workhorse. The double cab was introduced in 1958 with space for six workers and their tools but heavy loads still push the engine to its limit. In praise of the legendary 1.1 liter, 25 horsepower boxer engine taken from the Beetle. It's no surprise that a load of one and a half tons had the engine puffing and groaning, so the engineers gave it a shorter gear ratio. That brought the top speed down to 80 kilometers per hour, but made it more dependable, as a workhorse should be. The 1.2 liter engine and this one delivers 34 horsepower. These days, the vintage T1 buses are mostly retired from their labors. With no load, they can be surprisingly nippy. Even if the maximum speed of just 95 kilometers per hour and the partially synchronized transmission will keep a drive in the country very leisurely. Christoph attributes the VW bus's enormous success to its incredible versatility. The version he's driving now is a double cab pickup, or as its fans call it, a doka. And dokas were the preferred vehicle of builders. The high load silt helps it get through the rough terrain, such as foundation pits, with ease. Like all the other editions, the double cab pickup was a bestseller, and 1958 Volkswagen moved production from Wolfsburg to a plant built especially for commercial vehicles in Hanover. Three years later, the one millionth VW bus rolled off the assembly line. Christoph says the VW bus is the ultimate multi-purpose vehicle, a workhorse, a home, an ambulance, a lifestyle mobile. The only limits are the owner's imagination. The aerodynamically optimized body and lightweight construction left the competition back for dust. 
It became one of the driving forces of West Germany's post-war recovery, a technology innovator, and without a doubt, a milestone in automotive history. Definitely a milestone in automobile history.